Hello everybody, I'm Christopher Zimmerman, Music Director of the Fairfax Symphony Orchestra and today I have the great pleasure of having a, an online chat with Trevor Mowry who is our second oboist in the Fairfax Symphony Orchestra and a relative newcomer to the orchestra. Uh, welcome Trevor, it's great to have you here. Hi Maestro, uh, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. How long actually have you, have you played with the FSO? Uh, I played with the uh, Fairfax Symphony for four years. I actually had to look it up earlier today because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't remember the exact date, but uh, the 2016-2017 season was my first one. So this is season number four. Yeah, uh, time does uh, go by fast, doesn't it? It does. That's just the other day you auditioned, but anyway, that's, that's great. Um, so uh, is there something unexpected, Trevor, that people might be interested to know about you before we talk about your music and playing with the FSO? Uh, well, there's always unexpected or uh, perhaps surprising things about oboe players, I feel, where sometimes uh, a little bit of an unusual lot. Um, but maybe uh, uh, specific to our audiences, I, uh, um, you know, Fairfax is not my hometown, but I did uh, spend a couple of years in the DC area growing up during my youth. My family lived in Rockville, Maryland. Um, it was during my toddler year, so I didn't do a lot of oboe playing at that time. Um, but it's, uh, it's nice now to sort of have um, once again landed in this area that I was able to spend a few years in when I was young. So Trevor, uh, you know, as you know, of course, we had to cancel our last two concerts of the season. Um, and we're waiting to see when we're going to start up again. Of course, I hope it's going to be uh, right on time, but we, we have to wait and see. Uh, how are you actually managing during this sort of crazy time? Uh, my wife, Laura, and I were taking it one day at a time during this, these really strange circumstances. We have uh, a 16-month-old daughter, so she takes care of all of our available time. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's seeing to it that we are not bored for even a single moment. Um, well, look, it's great having you, as I say, today. Uh, I'm sure, like me, you miss our concerts um, and the concerts we give for the community in general. What would you say you miss most about not being able to perform for our live audiences? Uh, the, I think the thing I miss the most about our concerts is just the sound of a live symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. I mean, getting all, all, all of us together on the same stage with our colleagues um, obviously, as musicians, we all listen to recordings a lot. We're familiar with how an orchestra sounds, but there's just something about sitting up there on stage together and be getting this total, um, total surround sound of the, of the symphony orchestra. It's such a thrilling experience. I think that's what I miss the most because there's just no way, to, there's no way to duplicate that. And if I can actually respond to that a bit, go off on a tangent again. Uh, that reminds me that another job you have, of course, is playing in one of the military ensembles where uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that because, of course, you're also surrounded by players, but it's of a very different nature because they're not string players, I believe. And or maybe there are some, I don't know, but it's a smaller group, right? So how would that compare in terms of the sort of inundation of sound or, the, or that type of experience? Sure. So for... Our audience members who might not be aware, my day job, so to speak, is uh, playing uh, co-principal oboe with the president's own United States Marine Band, uh, which is based at Marine Barracks, Washington, in D.C. Um, it's 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 interesting in a in a wind ensemble, the oboe section is placed right up at the front. We sit in the front row as opposed to an orchestra where we're sort of in the middle or in the front row of the woodwinds. Um, Personally, I always feel a lot more comfortable in the middle, um, the, uh, where in the orchestra setup. Uh, yeah, the oboe um, is an instrument that tends to project. Maybe that's a polite way to put it. Um, and uh, when you're sitting right in the front row, you feel, you feel like you're really you know, basically in, in, in the laps of the people sitting in the front row. Um, so it's... In an orchestra, you really are surrounded by the sound because you've got uh, wonderful musicians on all sides of you. Um, it's a very different experience with the wind ensemble and a very different way of listening uh, being up in that front row. Uh, it's, I guess it's a little taste of what it must be like for the concertmaster or the other uh, principal string players um, in that setting because you really do feel like you are um, 
leading the ensemble a little bit more or leading that sound since you're right there in that front row um, versus being kind of in the thick of it. Uh, personally, I, I, I really enjoy being in the thick of it um, and getting to kind of, you get a little taste of everything that way. And I think, I think many people know this, but just to sort of emphasize the point, the president of Zone, I mean, congratulations on that job because I know it is one of really the most elite groups, not only in this area, but in the entire country. That is really an accomplishment. And we're really happy oh, to thank have you. you. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful to be uh, part of the president's own and to get to serve my country while pursuing um, you know, my passion playing music. And um, uh, yeah, the, the caliber of the musicians in that ensemble is um, beyond compare. I'm really lucky to get to work with the people that I do. And one of the biggest or a uh, kind of major piece of evidence of the high caliber of playing is that there are um, several of us who also play in the in the Fairfax Symphony. Um, Chris Ferrari on trumpet, Chris Frankie on violin, uh, uh, Greta Richard plays horn. Um, yeah, it's it's wonderful to get to see some of my colleagues, uh, you know, in kind of both of those spheres. Yeah, we we I'm really I, we but I am really grateful to have you too. And I'm glad you. you auditioned and I'm glad you won it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so Trevor, uh, could you tell us a bit about the instrument you play, your oboe? Sure. I just, I happen to have an oboe right here. Wouldn't, wouldn't you know it? Um, so yes, I play the oboe, which is a member of the Woodwind family. Uh, you may be able to tell on your screen that it's made out of the same kind of wood as the clarinet, the same color. Uh, the major difference between an oboe and a clarinet or um, the other members of the woodwind family is the reed, which is this little guy right here. So I can hold that up so people at home can actually see it. This is very, uh, two very thin, small pieces of cane tied together that vibrate when you blow into it. Um, the reed is really what gives the oboe its sound and uh, oboe players as, um, our viewers may know, uh, most professional oboe players uh, make their own reeds. And that way it allows you to really uh, find and shape your own voice and really um, tailor your reeds to your individual face structure and preference and comfort and all that good stuff. And uh, uh, playing the oboe in an orchestra is, I mean, it, orchestra music is our bread and butter. Uh, um, so many of history's greatest composers wrote such great music for the oboe to play, specifically in orchestra pieces. Uh, so it's really where um, where oboe players mm -hmm. thrive. So can I just so I don't play the oboe, but the the, the business of of making the uh, the reed, and I'm not being funny now, is really I hear is really an art form in itself. Certainly in terms of the amount of time and attention it needs, right, in to, to make this read fit you individually, not only physically, but kind of musically speaking. Can, yeah. you, can you tell us, uh, I mean, not the details of how you do it exactly, but sure. maybe the significance of it and the time it takes. Yeah, I would say read making and practicing are fairly equal for me in terms of uh, time commitment, how much time I spend yeah. doing both. Um, because you, uh, uh, without a read that functions properly, you can't even, you can't even begin. Um, right. So really, um, in, in a lot of ways, the read is the instrument. And um, you, know, you could pass around the same read to four different players and they would all sound like themselves. Uh, so it's not that you know, you could, uh, that, that you're not involved at all in the, in the creation of that sound. Um, but it does make a tremendous difference of what you can do musically on the instrument. Um, a really good read allows you to sort of uh, bypass the, um, the, the physical necessities of playing the instrument and get directly to the music, that's interesting, and and that's that's the motivation for me because uh, read making is something that uh, when I was a student uh, was not something that came naturally to me. It's something that I really had to to work at, but the motivation was always okay. This thing is going to allow me to translate 
what I can imagine the music sounding like out here into the into the real world. So it's it's really something that oboe players uh, rely on heavily, um, maybe too much so for some of us. Uh, and it can it can be frustrating when when it's not working or it's not going well. Uh, but when when you get a good read, you just you feel like you can do anything, and uh, you sort of feel like you've um, you've bent nature to your will because you've 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 taken this this piece of plant matter and fashioned it into this thing that allows you to um, to to play great music. So, other than the beauty of the read and the shaping of it, is there something else? And of course, the problems of uh, well, I shouldn't say about the brain business of, of how you actually, your breathing and all that when it comes to uh, mastering this instrument. Is there something else that inspired you to play the oboe? Uh, I started playing the oboe when I was in fourth grade. I took piano lessons starting from a young age. And fourth grade in, in my school is when you could start um, playing in your school band. And really what inspired me about the oboe what caught my interest was just that it was something kind of different uh and kind of unusual maybe yeah I, I knew what a clarinet was my brother played the clarinet i knew what the saxophone was i knew what the trumpet was but uh the band director in my school band made a big deal uh when i was in fourth grade about how they were offering uh students the chance to play the oboe for the first time they, had, they hadn't let students try the oboe before this year it was something new and something different and and something about the sound um, just caught my ear and uh, they they let us pick two different instruments to try um, so I chose the oboe and then just to try something else I also uh, chose to try the trumpet and uh, between the two the oboe was the one I can make a sound come out of and um, the rest as they say is history. <laughs> That's great. And can you tell us, um, Trevor, what, about a favorite piece that you love to perform? And, oh, and, wow. um, oh, a piece I love to perform. There's, there's so many, particularly in the orchestra, again, because composers gave us so many, um, so many wonderful pieces to play. Uh, I think a particular favorite of mine and one that, um, has always been inspiring or enjoyable to me and was a big motivator for me uh, when I was young uh, is uh, Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade. Mm. Uh, such an imaginative piece, you know, such rich color, such great writing for all of the wind instruments. Uh, it was one of the first orchestral excerpts I learned uh, when I started taking uh, private lessons. It was uh, one of the excerpts that I, um, played to get into the youth orchestra program that I played in in Chicago when I was growing up. Um, and it's just one, it's a piece that's always stayed with me. And uh, every time I've had the chance to perform it, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that piece, Trevor, because you may or may not know we've been, during this, this crazy time, we've been uh, putting up on our website archival performances Ah. the past few years uh and i've been introducing them and in fact that was one we recently put up online oh no kidding yeah i i it, swear i had i had no idea we did not plan this in advance <laughs> no, no. and i should have had you introduce some of the movements because you're so passionate about it but it is a great piece there's no doubt about it oh yeah playing since we're talking so much about your instrument would you mind playing a little bit for us of course i'd be delighted to play something i actually was uh in preparation for our chat i was thinking about what might be an appropriate selection to play today given all these circumstances and um uh one of the composers to me uh whose music regarding loss 
and uh, tragedy has always uh, um, has always spoken to me as the music of Brahms. Um, of course, um, tragedy and loss uh, is uh, the source of many pieces of music, but to me, what distinguishes Brahms um, primarily in his uh, German Requiem is that he's writing the music not so much to mourn those who have passed on, but he's writing the music to console those of us who are dealing with that loss. Um, and uh, a similar piece to the, to the German Requiem is this piece for, for chorus and orchestra, um, his Opus 82 uh, called um, Neenia. I'm probably butchering that title. But it's this piece that opens with this, uh, this amazing um, melody in the oboe. So I wanted to play, play this opening. It's about, it's about a minute and a half. Uh, I've got it right here on my stand. I hope um, this is okay, my uh, playing position and everything, but here we go. Thanks, Trevor. Of course. 